Great. Um, thanks very much uh, for inviting me to speak uh, at, at this next conference. Um, for people on Zoom, I'd be uh, happy to, to see your faces if you're willing to turn your cameras on. Um, uh, I'll try and keep an eye on the chat, but uh, if I don't, feel free to unmute yourselves and, and ask a question. Um, so I want to, uh, to talk about, um, uh, so three, three related uh, objects, um, a class of polynomials called log concave polynomials, a uh, combinatorial object called matroids, which we've seen many times uh, this week, um, and expanders. This is joint work with Nima Anari, Kweepi Lu, and uh, Cheyenne Oves Garan. Um, the, the warning that I have is that there's not linear programming and there's, there's arguably not, there's not sort of explicit tropical geometry in what I'm going to describe, uh, but I'll mention some, some connections that are not part of my work uh, towards the end uh, between these things. Uh, okay, um, so I, I wanted to start off, first off, everyone can hear me and see the screen. Yes. We can even move. Great. Okay. Um, so I want to talk. Start off by talking about expansion, um, the third, the third on my list, um, and then we'll take a detour and come back to it at the end. Um, so if I have a graph, um, then I might the the expansion um, is <laughs> defined to be um, so the minimum over all subsets uh, of of vertices. Um, where the, the quantity I take is I, by my subset of vertices I use to, to cut the vertices in two. And I look at how many edges go between the two sides um, divided by the, the side of the minimum, the minimum side. So what I want is I want, you know, um, so, so large expansion uh, means that um, subsets have, you know, lots of neighbors relative to their size, small expansion uh, means that there's some subset that doesn't, that doesn't sort of expand out once you take its neighbors. Um, and there's lots of reasons to be interested in expansion. Uh, one is the behavior of, of random walks on your graph. One can, can uh, imagine that if you have a good expansion, then random walks will mix quickly. Um, uh, one uh, sort of uh, classical um, inequality for, for expansion uh, is Cheeger's inequality, uh, which bounds this value expansion in terms of the second eigenvalue uh, of the adjacency matrix of the graph, if it's a, if it's a D regular graph. Um, and so this will very much be a, a story about second eigenvalues of matrices. Um, and uh, in the, the late 80s, there was a conjecture by Mihaly and Bazarani that the edge graph of every 0, 1 polytope has expansion at least one. Um, and the one consequence of the stuff that I will talk about today is that this holds for matroid polytopes, which are very special types of 0, 1 polytopes. Um, so just to crash, I know that many of you are probably familiar with matroids, but just as a, as a crash course. Um, so uh, a matroid uh, is a combinatorial gadget modeling independence, has a ground set, which for me is going to be one through n, uh, and we can write it down in terms of its independent sets, which is a non-empty collection of subsets of one through n uh, with two properties. Uh, one is that it's closed under inclusion, which means that it's a simplicial complex. Um, and the other is a sort of exchange property, which is that if you have uh, two subsets that you're calling independent and one is larger, then you can pick something from the larger one that's not in the smaller one and add it to the smaller one so that you get something independent. Um, this, this second condition, uh, the second condition um, implies that all of the maximal elements uh, maximal independent subsets have the same size. Um, and uh, those will be called the bases of the matroid. Because they have the same size, this size uh, we can take to be the rank and it's independent of which maximal subset we choose. 
uh, the matroid polytope that we associate, uh, the polytope we associate to this is the convex hull of the indicator vectors of the bases of these maximal independent subsets. Um, and for me, one uh, extra special encoding is going to be the, the polynomial we associate to that with it's just the, the polynomial in n variables that is just the, the basis generating polynomial. So every basis uh, will get a square free monomial and we sum them all up with coefficients one. Uh, so as a, a canonical example, if we take uh, n vectors uh, on any field, um, sorry, a vector space over any field, uh, then we get a matroid uh, by taking the independent sets to be the collections of indices for which these vectors are linearly independent, uh, and the collection of bases to be the maximally linearly independent uh, subsets, which are going to be the, the set of indices so that the vectors uh, form a basis for their span. Um, and in this case, the rank is just going to be the dimension of that span. Uh, so for example, uh, here I've taken four, four vectors in the plane, generic looking vectors in the plane. Uh, any pair of them span this plane and so form a basis. Uh, and so my set of bases is all subsets of one through four of size two. Um, the, the corresponding polytope uh, is a polytope in four dimensions. <laughs> uh, it's the convex hull of all zero one vectors uh, with exactly two ones. Um, this lies in a three dimensional subspace and we get an octahedron where, you know, here is E1 plus E2, maybe the bottom is E3 plus E4, and I leave you to label the rest. Um, and the, the corresponding matroid polynomial uh, is just the elementary symmetric polynomial of degree two in, in four variables. Uh, namely for every pair ij, um, uh, one through four, we just sum up xi times x2. Um, and just as a, my, my non-example of a matroid for the day um, is that if I take a collection of subsets one, two, and three, four, these are not the bases for any matroid. Um, so I leave you to, to convince yourself of that, uh, that um, using, using the second exchange property. Well, on both, really. Um, okay, any questions so far? Um, and so what we're going to see is that there's actually a, a very nice relationship between, between matroids and, and log concavity. Um, so log concavity, uh, so I want to talk about log concave polynomials. Um, so I'm going to take a, a polynomial with, with non-negative real coefficients in, in n variables. Um, I'm going to say that it's log concave if either it's identically zero or um, log of f uh, as a function on the positive orthend uh, is concave. So it's, it's Hessian is negative semi-definite everywhere on the positive orthend. Um, just as a sanity check, uh, so if f has non-negative coefficients then, and is non-zero, then it defines a positive function. It takes positive values everywhere in the positive orthent, and so we can take the log. The log of that is a well-defined function. So this this function at least makes sense. And what we want is that the function is concave everywhere. Um, and we're saying that it's strongly log concave if if not only uh, f but all of its derivatives also have this property. So its derivatives will also have not its derivatives with respect to, to any number of variables. So here, this is my shorthand for taking any number of derivatives um, with respect to the variables. The derivatives will still have non-negative coefficients. So this, uh, again, this function at least still makes sense. Um, and I'll just note that uh, uh, similar, um, similar notions have been been studied, and in particular, uh, it turns out that uh, if you add in a homogeneity assumption, that this class of polynomials is it has many different names now, and one of them is Lorentzian, which was uh, introduced by uh, Peter Benin and Jinhe in 2019. 
um, the easiest way to, to get such a polynomial, in my opinion, is to take just a, a polynomial in one variable um, that has a, a non-positive real roots. <laughs> so uh, let's see what, so here is my expression of such a polynomial uh, factored out. Um, and, and what does it mean for the, the polynomial to be log concave? Uh, well, we can check its second derivative. And if you and if you expand, if you do the calculus exercise and you expand out its second derivative, what you get, the product turns into a sum, um, and you just get a sum of terms uh, minus one over x plus r i squared, uh, which is takes uh, negative values everywhere it's defined, um, and in particular, uh, away from the roots it's defined, and so it takes negative values. Um, uh, and so it's negative on the entire positive real line, meaning that the log of f is concave on the entire positive real line. So this shows that it's log concave. Um, and I claim that it's also strongly log concave uh, because if we take a derivative of a polynomial of this form, um, can check that the roots, I don't know why I wrote partial derivative, but if the, if these are the, the roots of f, um, then I take a, a derivative and the roots actually have to interlace. So we're gonna get another real rooted polynomial, all of whose roots are less than or equal to zero. Um, and so redoing this computation with the roots of the derivative, we're gonna get the exact same thing, that this polynomial is log concave. And from there, you can just induct. Um, so that's one, one example of a, a polynomial with this property. Um, there are many more. Um, so there's a, there's a multivariate generalization of real rootedness called stability. Um, uh, and so real stable poly, polynomial, using a similar argument, uh, one can show that real stable polynomials with, with non-negative coefficients uh, have this property. Um, Maybe for, for the optimization uh, crowd, um, I'll just note that you know, this, is, this is very much related to sort of log concavity of barrier functions um, for interior point methods um, uh, that come up. Um, yeah, but there are, there are many other very nice, um, nice examples of this. Uh, so mixed volume polynomials. Uh, have this property uh, by a generalization of the Brun Minkowski theorem. So, this is the, yeah. Yeah. If you input any uh, compact con uh, convex sets K1 through Kn and uh, take the, well, okay. So, this is a polynomial and it turns out to be a strong with block um, There's also a uh, so nice polynomials from combinatorics. Uh, so for people who know what these are, there's uh, one can uh, look at sure polynomials, certain so sure polynomials, which are a class of polynomials that come up in algebraic combinatorics, also have this property. Um, okay. Any questions? This is uh, one of the important definitions. Uh, any any questions so far? Maybe. Um, so as I said, there's this very nice connection uh, between matroids and, and log concave polynomials. Um, so it's a theorem now proven by, by many groups of people um, that if I take uh, any matroid, there are two sort of natural uh, polynomials that I can write down for it. One was the polynomial I wrote down before, the, the basis generating polynomial. Um, and, and another is uh, the homogenization of the, the independent set generating polynomial, where I arrange over all independent sets um, and write down their square, from, square free monomials and just homogenize with an additional variable. Um, for any matroid, both of these polynomials are, are strongly log concave. Um, so that's, that's sort of one of the big theorems. Uh, I'll say that the, one of the reasons that there are so many classes of people found this at the same time um, is that 
the strong log concavity is sort of a simplification of conditions that occur in this uh, sort of groundbreaking work by Adepresito, who and Katz on combinatorial Hodge theory. Um, and so, you know, so various groups of people tried to, to simplify the, it, it, their, their conditions there are, are somewhat involved in some, some you know, the confluence of, of people working on this, I think really came from um, people trying to simplify the, the conditions in this group. Uh, um, Cynthia, is N the number of variables or the rank of the matroid? N is the, the number of variables and is the, the size of the ground set of the matroid. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, so the degree of the polynomial will match the rank of the matroid. Okay, gotcha. Because the, the degree will be the size of a basis. Yeah. Um, so in this example, let's see how far back it is. Yeah, so in this example, uh, this matroid uh, was on four elements and had rank two. Uh, and that corresponds to this polynomial being in four variables uh, and being degree two. Uh, and then for this one, we just add in an extra variable to homogenize. Um, okay. So just to, to digest this property of log concavity for a moment. Um, so a polynomial, so let's just do the now multivariable calculus exercise. Um, so a polynomial f is, what does it mean for a polynomial f to be log concave at point A in the positive orthon? Um, it means that the hessian of, oh, that's, oh no, <laughs> sorry, clicked something wrong. Um, that the, the hessian uh, of the log of f evaluated at this point should be negative semi-definite. Uh, and if you actually expand out what the hessian of the log is, uh, what you get is f times the hessian of just the polynomial f uh, minus the gradient times its, times its transpose, all divided by f squared. Um, and so this, uh, this matrix, when evaluated at a point in the positive orthon, we want to be negative semi-definite. Um, and if we actually look at this, this is, uh, because f is not negative, um, so what this is, is this, when we evaluate, this is a positive scalar times the hessian, minus uh, something that's rank one, all divided by a positive scalar. Um, and so then uh, it's, it's not too difficult to see that this means that the Hessian, not the Hessian of the log, but just the Hessian evaluated at this point has to be negative semi-definite on the hyperplane orthogonal to the gradient. Um, that when, when this term sort of cancels out, then uh, then this quadrat the for quadratic form defined by the Hessian has to be negative. Um, and so I've tried to draw the, the picture of the, um, the value. So the value is taken by the Hessian um, is that it's, it's necessarily going to be positive on the positive orthant because its entries will all be non-negative, um, but it has to be take negative values on some hyperplane namely the hyperplane orthogonal to the gradient. Um, and so from this, you can argue to yourself that, um, that this, this Hessian uh, has at most one positive eigenvalue. And in fact, because it's positive on the, the positive orthon, it needs to have a positive eigenvalue. Um, so we can use this to, to do a sanity check on this, this matroid condition. Um, so if I take uh, the matroid polynomial I started out with, um, this elementary symmetric polynomial, and I look at its Hessian, uh, this will just be the all ones matrix with a zero dot diagonal. Um, and we can write this as the rank one all ones matrix uh, minus the identity. Um, and so this will have one positive eigen value with eigenvector all ones, and then the rest will be negative. Everything orthogonal to that uh, will take a negative, uh, will be negative on this quadratic form. 
um, and we can check our non-example. Um, so if we write down the polynomial corresponding to uh, the, the non-metroid, one, two, and three, four, um, the, then the Hessian will just be a, a two by two block. And it's not too hard to see that this will have two positive eigenvalues and two negative eigenvalues. Um, uh, can uh, I ask a question? Sure. Uh, is, is the converse of the theorem also true? Uh, yeah, the converse of the theorem is actually also true. Um, so one way to test if you have a matroid is, is to test the log concavity of this polynomial. So this is another equivalent way of defining a matroid. Yeah, this is another equivalent way of uh, defining a matroid. Uh, if I, I, I don't think it's the, it would necessarily be the most efficient way of doing it, but this, this, is, this is another way of uh, defining a matroid, yeah. So do, do you need both as an, is it enough to look at the base generating polynomial and say if it is strongly log concave, then deform bases? Or yeah. do you need both conditions? That's enough. Yeah. So just just uh, just this polynomial. So yeah. So if you have a collection of subsets of the same size um, of, of one through n of some size d, and uh, then and you write down it's the generating polynomial. So you sum up the monomial square free monomial for every subset. You turn it into a square free monomial and you sum them all up with coefficients one. Um, then the collection of subsets are the bases of a matroid uh, if and only if this polynomial is, is log concave on the positive one. And for, yeah, for polynomials like this that are square free, it turns out that uh, log concavity and strong log concavity are the same. So you sort of get, you can get the derivatives for free. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Yeah, great question. Um, so, so one consequence of this, and one of the consequences that was uh, um, for which a, a weaker form appeared in this the combinatorial Hodge theory story um, is log concavity of, of coefficients. Um, so if you have, uh, so this was actually shown by Gervitz in 08, who studied this class of polynomials, is that if you have uh, a polynomial in just two variables, x and y, um, that's homogeneous of degree n here, um, and it is strongly log concave, uh, then its coefficients uh, are satisfy a discrete log concavity, sometimes called ultra log concavity, uh, where if you divide them by all by the corresponding binomial coefficients, then this, this disc discrete sequence is, is log concave. Um, so these are for real rooted polynomials, uh, these are known as Newton's inequalities, and they also hold for strongly log concave polynomials. Um, and if you want to prove this, uh, the, the one line proof, which obviously would need to be expanded a little bit, uh, is that you can actually get this if you take, you can pick out uh, these coefficients uh, by taking k minus one derivatives with respect to x and n minus k minus one derivatives with respect to y to get down to just a quadratic polynomial with just those three coefficients. Um, the Hessian of this quadratic needs to have one positive eigenvalue. Um, uh, sorry, at most one positive eigenvalue. Uh, and it, so it will have one positive and at most one negative. And so the determinant will be non-positive. And if you actually expand out what all that means in terms of the coefficients, this is exactly the inequality that you get. Um, and so then one, uh, one immediate consequence uh, of the, the theorem on the slide before um, was that we get this for the, um, the sequence of sizes of independent sets um, of a metroid. So if I count uh, the independent sets of a, of a given size, um, and, and divide each of these by the corresponding binomial coefficient, then this, this sequence is log concave discrete in a discrete sense. Um, 
and uh, yeah, so this is this is a corollary from the fact that uh, the the homogenization of the independent set uh, polynomial is strongly log concave, um, and one can check that if you specialize it so that all of the n variables x1 through xn are the same, um, then this is still strongly log concave, uh, and then this gives you exactly the, the polynomial that you want to, to input into to Gerwitz's theorem. Um, okay, and so for the, this is not going to make any sense if you haven't seen it before, but so for the experts, um, uh, it turns out that uh, the, the generalization of the notion of, of matroids, um, the correct one here um, is, is integer points in a generalized permutahedron. Um, so, so one can show that for a homogeneous polynomial with non-negative coefficients, um, so many things are, are equivalent. Uh, F is strongly log concave. F is Lorentzian, which I'm not even going to define for you. Um, and that the, um, the monomials appearing with non-zero coefficient uh, are the integer points in a special type of polytope known as a generalized permutahedron which I'm not gonna define for you, sorry. So generalization of matroid polytopes. Um, and that the, the quadratic derivatives are, are all log concave. Um, so whenever you, whenever you take derivatives to get down to a quadratic polynomial, that these are log concave on the positive portion. Um, Um, okay. I have not sort of given enough definitions for this to make sense, but I don't want to, I just want to include it for the experts and, and feel free to ask uh, afterwards. Um, uh, can I ask a question? So sorry. what was the, so why is Mason's conjecture interesting? Can you just interpret this conjecture and is there any application to this? Um, so, well, what sort of, yeah, so I think, that, um, I mean, in combinatorics, I think people are just generally, you know, there's a lot of interesting appearance of, un of um, log convex sequences. And so I think understanding of that is sort of independent theoretical interest. Um, I mean, in terms of this, yeah, so, so one can think about this number as the probability that uh, if you choose a random subset of size k from the numbers one through n, uh, this number gives you the probability that it's independent. Um, and so you might, those are numbers you might be, be interested in if you're trying to do some sort of sampling for independent sets of matrices. Um, a, a kind of related, uh, yeah, okay. The short answer is, I, I don't know that there's a, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure what sort of application you want, um, but yeah, I think those, those, the numbers are sort of independent. <laughs> interest. Um, but is this related to the expansion property of the... Hmm. Uh, so the, yeah, so, so let's get back to, so this is somewhat of a sidebar. Um, so the, yeah, so, so one part of the, um, the main applications come from this expansion, um, which let's get back to. Yeah, I promise we'll get back to expansion sort of right now. Um, so uh, I want to, um, say one or two words about uh, the intuition of the, the proof of this. Um, so um, a few slides ago, we said that um, log concavity has to do with uh, the quadratic form defined by the Hessian of the polynomial, taking negative values on some hyperplane. Um, and I think a useful observation is that if you have two such quadratic forms, 
that are take positive values on the positive orthant and uh, negative values on some hyperplane, uh, that you can actually uh, take positive linear combinations of them and it will have the same property. Um, that they will still have positive, the, the convex combination will have positive values, not take, have to take positive values on the positive orthant and take negative values on this hyperplane. Um, and so this gives you a way of, of yeah, combining, <laughs> uh, uh, combining these. Um, and, and so to actually write down a, a a useful characterization of strong log concavity. Um, I want to uh, just associate a graph briefly to a polynomial. Um, so this is just going to be a, a graph on vertices one through n, where I, I keep track, uh, where I, I will put uh, an edge. Oh, that disappears. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I put uh, an edge between i and j whenever the derivative with respect to both of these is not identically zero. Um, and uh, if I do this, then um, one can, can write down a, a characterization of strong log concavity as follows. Uh, a polynomial is strongly log concave if uh, the graph of both f and all of its uh, derivatives is connected. Um, so this is some combinatorial condition. Uh, and that whenever I take derivatives down to a quadratic, uh, I get this, this quadratic um, polynomial. The quadratic form has at most one positive eigen. Um, and so, so using this idea of, of summing things up um, and, and using the uh, equation that if I have a homogeneous polynomial, then I can, can write it uh, as, a, as a weighted, it's evaluation as a weighted sum of its derivatives. Um, I can actually build up from, from derivatives, I can sort of build back up to the, the full polynomial. This is a very rough sketch of, of the idea. And Cynthia, just to be clear, the graph has to be connected for any evaluation or of the, the X's, or is it, as you said, like it's not identically zero as in there is some. Yeah, it's not uh, identically zero. Um, okay. and, and since the polynomial has non-negative coefficients, it's the same as evaluating at a, at a point. You can test, you know, you could test it by evaluating at some point in the positive work. Uh, I think I wrote down all the all ones, but it 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 won't it won't matter um, because because it's it, you know if you have non-negative coefficients, then um, yeah, the the only way for that the evaluation is zero is if the whole polynomial is zero, and the yeah non-negative the derivatives will inherit the non-negative coefficients. Yeah, great. Thanks. Sorry, and the second condition does not imply the first? Uh, this condition? No. Um, so this is, so this one should think of as a combinatorial condition. Um, this is saying our coefficients, zero, are certain things zero or not zero? Um, uh -huh. The second one is beta, whereas the first one is. Yeah, and and this this is an actual. Um, uh, <laughs> so this this gives a constraint on the actual coefficients, not just whether they're zero or not. If that makes mm -hmm. sense, this is you know. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and so I say this is the this is the stronger. Well, yeah, you need both. Um, but yeah, I'll. I'll the connectivity is sort of needed for this, this inductive step to, to go through. Um, okay. Um, and now to, so to, to change the topics again slightly, 
Um, so I want to I want to connect this to Markov chains, um, and so, and so and also e expansion. Um, so so if I if I'm given a, a log concave polynomial with non-negative coefficients, I could associate to it uh, a Markov chain in the following way. Um, I have a matrix. If I evaluate, say, at any point in the positive orphan, such as the all ones vector, then I have uh, a matrix, symmetric matrix uh, with non negative entries given by evaluating the Hessian. Um, and I can, I can multiply this by a diagonal matrix to make it stochastic. And so this will, this will define uh, a Markov chain for me on n elements. Um, and this condition of log concavity. Uh, means that it's set, the second eigenvalue of this matrix will be less than or equal to zero. This, this was the, yeah, this is what we get from log concavity, is that the Hessian uh, has this property. And so in particular, if I um, <laughs> average this with the identity matrix, if I make this into a lazier Markov chain, its second eigenvalue will be at most one half. It's not clear why I would want to do that, but it's a, hopefully at least true. Um, so just for example, uh, for our favorite uh, elementary symmetric polynomial, um, the Hessian evaluate the all ones vector is, is this matrix. And uh, to make it stochastic, I just scale the whole thing by one third. Uh, if I take, uh, if I average this with the identity matrix, I get the following, uh, the following matrix. Um, and the, the reason I might want to do this um, is because this actually, I can describe this uh, as, uh, um, so the, the Markov chain given by this matrix, I can describe in the following way, um, is if I, start, uh, if I start at some element, I in, in one through four, um, I can do is I can, uh, add j uh, uniformly at random. So now I have, uh, uh, I can think of having, moving to a subset of size two, ij. Um, and then uh, remove, uh, remove um, i, oh, it's too big, sorry. Uh, Remove i or j, so I can go to i j, where I remove one of the elements, um, and I remove one of the elements uniformly at random from this set. Um, so if I, you know, if I started with one, and I might go to one two, and then I will choose one of the elements. I will, you know, flip a coin, decide which of the elements one two to chuck away. Um, and, and what will happen? So I'll have, uh, if I start at one, then I'll have a one sixth chance of moving to two because I had to pick two to add. And then I had to keep, uh, keep two and chuck away one. <laughs> so if you, the product of those probabilities is one sixth and I'll have a one half chance of, of getting back to, to one because I could do that in one of three ways by adding anything else and then removing it. Um, and uh, this argument um, actually shows uh, that this, this matrix is positive semi-definite. Um, I've written it uh, as a, a, a matrix times its, its transpose, uh, where, where the matrix is sort of the transition matrix um, for this, for this uh, transition from subsets of size one to subsets of size two. Just the adjacency matrices, the, you know, <laughs> subsets of size one to subsets of size two. Um, yeah, uh, and so then I have a, so then I know that all of the eigenvalues of this matrix, uh, besides the top one are between zero and one half. Um, um, and so that, that will tell me something about the behavior of the Markov chain, because I'm bounding the absolute values, all the eigenvalues except for the top one, away from, away from one. Um, 
And then uh, actually what, so one can uh, go a little bit nuts with this. One can similarly use this to define uh, walks on higher dimensional faces of a simplicial complex. Um, and so here, the combinatorially minded should keep in mind the independence complex of a matrix. That's going to be the important example. Um, but if I, if I start with a simplicial complex that's pure of some dimension uh, d minus one, and I let delta of k denote the faces of dimension k minus one, uh, so meaning the subsets of size k that appear as faces, and maybe I have some, some weights on these faces that I don't want to really go into, then I can define two, two different Markov chains on subsets of size k. Um, and they're exactly what I, what I tried to describe in this example, is if I start with a subset of size k, then I can remove an element uniformly at random. Um, this gets me to down to something of size k minus 1. Uh, and then I can add uh, an element. Um, where I, for technical reasons, I want to do so sort of proportional to, um, to something associated to my coefficients. And this will get me back uh, to, to something of size k. Um, and similarly, if I'm not at the top dimension, then I could do the same thing. Uh, I mean, this also get, you know, I could add something and I could then delete it, delete something. Um, and um, so this gives me a whole um, collection of random walks that I would uh, on faces of a simplicial complex. Um, and somewhat miraculously, the, the eigenvalues of the transition matrices of these things are actually, you can, you can bound them in terms of each other. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah, one of the ideas is, is exactly as before, we sort of, you can, because you're, you're, you can write it as sort of two steps um, in a, uh, in, in, yeah, two, two, two sort of, into, you can think of it as a, a big Markov chain on, on both of these things. Um, you, can, you can really relate sort of the eigenvalues of this walk the eigenvalues of this walk as, as being the same, um, just uh, thinking of them as the eigenvalues of a matrix of A, A transpose and A transpose A. Um, uh, this was something that, um, so th these random walks on faces of simplicial complex is part of a, a very nice uh, story of something called high dimensional expanders developed by many people. Um, and in particular, uh, these, partic these walks um, that I'm defining uh, were studied by Kaufman and Oppenheim. Uh, and they um, have the following theorem, which is that if you look at, you have some simplicial complex um, uh, like this. If you look at all the links, um, want them to have a connected one skeleton, whatever that is, that's some combinatorial condition. Uh, and if the transition matrices uh, for one of these walk, for the sort of up, up down walk on all of the, the one dimensional links, uh, which will just be graphs, if these all have eigenvalue at most of half, um, then when you look, so this, these ones should think of as, as being small, these will be graphs uh, of size at most n. Then when you look at the transition matrix of the down up walk on the top dimensional faces, so these, there could be n choose d of these. Uh, so this was a much larger space that you're walking around. The transition matrix uh, of, of this walk has second eigenvalue at most one minus one over d. Um, so in particular, bounded away from one. That's the important thing. Uh, Cynthia? Yeah. So why, why are uh, the transition matrices, or I guess these one-dimensional links, why are things bigger going or smaller going up than going down? Why are things 
you you were talking about like the graphs uh, associated with these transition matrices being much bigger in the up, uh, much bigger in the down up direction than in the up down direction. Oh, uh, so that's uh, like comparing. They might not be. It's sort of comparing n choose in the in the in the ah, uniform ah, ah, sense. Okay. It's like can uh, it's like n choose k versus n choose k minus one. I see. I see. Um, yeah. Uh, so in this example, in this example, it's four versus six, and so the bigger one, you know, it could get bigger, but yeah, it all could, it could also get smaller. Yeah. Sorry if I I misspoke. Um, but um, I guess the important part of this theorem is that the matrices that appear here will have size at most n. They're small, um, and this the transition matrix on on this set could be huge. Could be n choose d size n choose d. Um, maybe that's the point. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that that might already be what I'm confused about. Um, yeah, so and they they do this thing of, of building up so that it's this intricate induction where you sort of build up from you know up up down walks on on certain links. Um, <laughs> And, and use those to, to bound eigenvalues of, of bigger and bigger blocks of, of bigger dimensional faces and various lengths of them. Um, yeah. For the moment, we might be able to just import. I would be happy to just import their theorem. Um, yeah, but it, it's a fairly complicated induction. Um, but the, the takeaway is that you know you have a transition matrix, you have sort of local, you can take local information, um, small local information, and then um, with sort of a connectivity assumption, get some global state. Get some statement about the random walk on this potentially large set. Um, and uh, so this this theory, this theory was was nicely uh, pre-existing for us, um, and we actually showed that these uh, these conditions, uh, if you write them down, are equivalent uh, to strong log concavity. Um, so if you start with a simplicial complex uh, with some some weights associated to it. Um, then it will it will satisfy these two conditions. It will be a high dimensional expander in this sense, if and only if the corresponding sort of uh, generating polynomial is strongly log concave. Um, and hopefully this is at least plausible, <laughs> um, in that this condition really relies on is is really on second eigenvalues of some n by n matrix. Um, and so then one corollary that we get uh, from, from this bound and from the, the fact that the basis generating polynomial of a matroid uh, satisfies these condition is that this gives you um, a, a random walk. So there's a, a random walk on the, the bases uh, of a matroid that converges to the uniform distribution um, whose mixing time uh, is, is R squared log n, where R is the rank of the matrix. Um, and then that, and this is this is sort of a very closely related uh, statement to this a statement I started out with about the expansion um, of the edge graph of the matrix portrait. Um, this has been, so this has been, you know, the bounds have been improved in, in various ways. Um, uh, but, but yeah, so this, this is sort of um, one of the big, one of the big consequences of, of matroid polynomials having this strong log concavity property. Um, uh, we started, we started a little late, right? Um, I'll take just a, a few more minutes. Um, so 
Okay, so just to sum up, uh, so so far we've so so matroid polynomials are strongly log concave. Um, it has nice consequences for discrete log concavity uh, of, of independent sets, for the numbers of independent sets, and it also has uh, um, these very nice uh, uh, consequences for expansion of the edge graph of a matroid polytope, um, and very much relatedly, uh, random walks on the, the bases of a matroid. Um, uh, since then, there's been um, uh, a lot of work in this area, and I just wanted to mention sort of two, two things uh, that I think are related that would be of interest uh, to, to people in this community, also to, to relate to the actual title of the workshop. Um, so one of them is this, uh, there's a, a, a paper um, put on the archive earlier this year by uh, Narayana and Shah and Srivastava, um, where they use, they don't use this theory exactly, but they use uh, um, very closely related ideas to actually give a bound on polytope diameter, which I think is very cool. I'm not at all an expert on polytope diameter, as I know there are people in the room, but um, so what their theorem says uh, is that if you have a, a bounded polytope uh, presented in the following form, uh, where the matrix A and vector B are integer, um, and you have some bound delta on all of the minors of the, the matrix uh, A and B, then uh, you can get the following bound for the diameter of the polytope, namely T squared delta squared log of M delta. Um, and the reason that I mentioned this here is that the, the proofs are, are sort of very similar in nature to some of the proofs um, that, that are used in the work that I talked about. Um, so, the, so the proofs actually rely on spectral gaps, gaps and eigenvalues uh, of certain operators associated to this polytope. Um, and in particular, the way they get those spectral gaps uh, is, is the same way it's very much related to the way that, that we got spectral depth gaps, namely uh, using the log concavity of a certain volume polynomial uh, or multiple volume polynomials associated to the polytope. Um, so I encourage you to check out the paper for the details, but they sort of show log concavity of, of volume polynomials of uh, simple, polyno uh, simple polytopes in terms of their slack, uh, uh, slack variables. And so it's very cool and it's very much related to, to this idea of, you know, you can use log concavity to get spectral gaps in things and spectral gaps are useful. Um, okay. Uh, and then the other, uh, almost as far as I know, completely unrelated uh, thing I wanted to mention is connection to tropicalizations. Um, so this is, this is very much, uh, uh, work so very prominent in the the work of Brennan and Hu um, is that if you consider strongly log concave polynomials uh, over real Poisson series, um, then this this corresponds very tightly uh, to something called m convex uh, functions and valuative matrices. Um, so the the theorem from their state the their paper is that if you have if you have some function on subsets of one through n of size d uh, to the, the extended rational numbers, this uh, is something called m convex. Um, if and only if there exists uh, a polynomial um, over so uh, in n variables of degree d. Uh, whose monomials exactly correspond to subsets of one through n of size d, so that f is strongly log concave. Um, uh, and uh, the, the valuations of these coefficients, the valuations of uh, these real Poisson series exactly match um, this function. Um, so just as a, 
as a very small example, um, if we took, here's a slightly modified uh, uh, example of our degree two polynomial and four variables where I just put a T in front of uh, these two monomials. Here for the, the T is sort of infinitesimally small. That's how we're thinking of T here. Um, then the, the valuation of, of these coefficients uh, is, is one and the valuation of all the other coefficients is zero. Um, did I write this on a slide? No. Um, and in fact, one can check, so the, the Hessian of this polynomial is zero t, t zero t, and then ones everywhere else. Um, and you can check that over the real Pousseau series, uh, this, uh, this, this matrix has exactly one positive eigenvalue. And in, yeah, in particular, the, in using the same proof, the Hessian of the log of F will be, will be negative semi-definite. All of its eigenvalues will be less than or equal to zero in the ordering of the Pousseau series. Um, and so as, as a corollary to this statement, you could get a sort of evaluated version of the, the theorem from before is that the, the set of evaluated matroids of rank D on N elements, uh, I think up to a sign is exactly equal to the valuation of coefficients of, of multi-affine, uh, so polynomials with square free uh, terms, multi-affine strongly log concave polynomials, um, degree D and N variables. Um, uh, so somehow this, so strong log concavity also closely captures evaluated, not just matroids, but evaluated matroids. Um, okay, so I think I am, I'm out of time. Uh, so just to, to sum up, so strong law concavity uh, includes lots of important examples like volume polynomials, stable polynomials, polynomials associated to matroids, um, implies discrete log concavity of the coefficients of, of polynomials, um, and uh, sort of gives distributions that can be efficiently approximately sampled um, uh, using using Markov chains that will that will mix that will reach their um, stationary distribution quickly. Um, that I will thank you. Will conclude and thank you for your attention.